and I knew Paramez, whom who we called Pudsey in our days. We grew up a block apart in Pawtucket in a ethnically mixed uh, lower middle income uh, neighborhood. At a young age, in our neighborhood was a place called Barry's Drugstore. He would go in there and was just fascinated with what was going on there. And these guys working and mixing this stuff up. And John Barry, the owner, would show him. So my mother could see he was, you know, fascinated by this. So for Christmas, she bought him this thing that looked like a medicine cabinet. And when it had two doors, I remember it was blue, you'd open it up and all these vials of different things were in there. And that was together with an instruction book as to what was possible to do with all this stuff. And I guess his grand moment came when he went outside for a certain experiment he was doing and he took a can, you know, the, an empty can, and he had this stuff and he put it under the can and he lit it up and the can flew up in the air about 30 feet, you know. Here it is, <laughs> rocket science, you know. Well, I'm sure that didn't slow down his interest in chemistry. In fact, if there was anything he knew very, very well, it was chemistry. He worked uh, at Simpson's Pharmacy in Pawtucket. He probably started on a soda fountain as we all, we were all soda jerks, so to speak. Paramez was what we called an A-boy at that time. He wore a white jacket and he was able to operate the soda fountain. Paramez worked in the store and then indicated that he wanted to go to the college of pharmacy, but couldn't really afford it. My father said, I'll pay you. Money. My grandfather was very close to Paramaz and the Abadizian family and ultimately paid for his college education. So there's a close relationship between even my father and my grandfather and the Abadizian family. We had a lot of physicians in the neighborhood who ra operated offices there and they would come to the pharmacy for lunch. There was a smoking room in the back of this pharmacy where the doctors used to come in and take a break and have a cigarette smoke. It was always amazing to watch him engaged in, uh, in medical discussions with some of those physicians. Pharmaceutical education in Rhode Island actually began in 1902. I met him in our freshman year at the College of Pharmacy. We did everything. We studied together, we went out, we socialized. He studied and worked, and he really didn't know much about socializing and I taught him to dance. I was hard of hearing, and in those days, we didn't have hearing aids. And he sensed that, you know, and he would help me as much as he could. Oh, I'd copy his notes and memorize them. And one day we're going into class and the professor would always have the questions on the board. And he says, by the way, he says, put their uses down, and I didn't hear it. And he yells out, Gene, put the uses. And the professor said, mind your own business. I never forgot that. He made sure that I heard it, you know. He says, the fact that I helped a legally deaf person with his studies, and he was able to graduate. That was his, his best accomplishment. Just another facet of helping others. Uh, which he continued to do even when he had his pharmacy. Back uh, 50 years or 60 years ago, many of the products were actually created within the, the individual retail pharmacy. You had people would compound things, they'd create tablets, create ta capsules, create lotions and creams. The profession has changed so much, as has the whole world. We did a lot of compound. We, did, we made suppositories, capsules. In many pharmacies, you were a point of contact for medicine. The patient contact never changed, and that uh, is where I think someone like Param is really shown by his ability to interact with people at all straps. He had this penchant for playing opera in the pharmacy, so when you went in there, you heard opera. He was a big fan of Pavarotti. I was 
uh, engaged to do a concert with Pavarotti and a member of the orchestra. And we were told that there would be no people coming in. Pavarotti came in with his wife and they struck up a conversation. And uh, he said, what are you doing here? He said, well, my brother plays. He says, come on, come in with me. We're having this rehearsal. Pavarotti comes out, he's in an apple doing this, saying, we're having a great time. He's just unbelievable to hear this voice. Then I'm looking out in the audience, and say, wait a minute, this guy looks familiar. Don't tell me, how the hell did he get in here? And he sat with Mrs. Pavarotti. So came into mission, and he just walks up on the stage. Like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> you know, what are you doing here? He says, well, look, Pavarotti invited me in. I was down with him in his dressing room. He offered me fruit, this and that. He asked me if I needed a ticket for the concert. I told him I already had one, but why don't you come and hear the rehearsal? So, and he said to sit with his wife. Said, oh, okay, <laughs> if that's the case. <laughs> you know, my days here aren't numbered, I'm all right. The one thing I always remember uh, about Paramus, long before E.F. Houghton, when Paramus spoke, everybody listened. I think Paramus is probably a great, you know, he was a living example of, of a trustworthy professional. And uh, I know he served as a role model for many students and many professionals in his day. I just think it's a wonderful tribute to a wonderful man. I really do. I think Paramaz is smiling up there and um, his spirit will be alive in the pharmacy building forever. <laughs>